Turn with me, if you will, to uh, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, and we're closing out that chapter. And uh, next week we'll be in chapter nine. And my, will it be a challenge to all of us as we go through. Some, I picked up something on the internet this past week. It said that he did not appreciate people preaching uh, verse by verse because it did not meet the needs of people. It did not meet, meet the needs. Because that you ought to take verses from the Bible that meet needs. Well, every one of the verses in the Bible meets my need. Isn't that right? And so that's why we go through it the chapter by chapter and try to get through it verse by verse. And I don't do a tremendous job, but I sure do enjoy trying. Uh, we have been in the book of Romans, and we uh, started out by uh, and asking a question from, uh, from a, a first portion of Scripture. And the question was this, is the whole world really lost? And in Romans chapter uh, 1, all the way through chapter 23, of chapter 3, verse 18, uh, Paul gives the answer. And uh, then in chapter 3, verse 19, all the way through this last verse in this chapter we are using this morning, he answers the question is, if the whole world is really lost, then how does God save the lost? And he tells us. And we get down to chapter 8. He begins to talk about some things that are very, very, very important. And then we get down to verse, well, as we think about getting down to verse, well, beginning with verse 31 all the way to 39, he gives us some, some reasons why we have eternal life. In the first section we talked about, we talked about the fact that in uh, chapter 8, verse 31 to 33, that we are secure through the power of Jesus Christ. So his power keeps us saved. And then we move on down to verse 34, and we found out that, that we are secure through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is not eternal, then we don't have eternal life. And so today we come to the point of where the third uh, aspect is that we are secure because of the passion of Jesus Christ. Now, inside of this, uh, if you'll know and notice in your notes, that we came to at least two or three conclusions. First of all, we, we concluded that because God has delivered you, there's, any, there's not anyone that can destroy you. Second conclusion is, because God has acquitted you, there isn't anyone that can indict, indict you. And then we come to collusion number... Conclusion number three is that because Jesus Christ redeemed us, there isn't anyone that can condemn us. Now we come to the fourth one, and it's talking about the passion of Christ. The passion of Christ. The little chorus that uh, the children sing. In fact, uh, someone asked Dr. R.G. Lee, the great expositor and many, many years pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. Has anybody now always ever heard Dr. Lee preach? Would you raise your hand? I've heard Dr. R.G. Lee preach. Yes, there's several of us heard him in person before he went to heaven. Dr. Lee was in, being interviewed by a reporter, and he said, uh, uh, Dr. Lee, you have a lot of uh, hymns in your hymn book. What is your favorite hymn? Well, he named a lot of good hymns, but he said, uh, I always come back uh, to the little chorus that's my favorite of all. It's Jesus loves me, this I know, 
for the Bible tells me so. And so that little chorus has been a blessing. How many of you sung that as kids? Would you raise your hand? You sung it as kids? Well, I'm going to let it let uh, Byron uh, go through it. And let me see, let you notice uh, some wording that may be just a little bit off, and you might want to want to identify it and as we go through the song. So let's all listen to it, if you will, everybody. And uh, Brother Byron, if you'll put it on now, get out of the way where everybody can see it, all right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yeah. And in the last verse, if I love him when I die. Yeah. It says if. If. It's not if. Right? <laughs> it's since. Since I love him. Anybody catch that? It, you know, well, anyway, I thought it very important. <laughs> and uh, it's a wonder my wife had to call it 10 years ago, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> So you can catch those things. Well, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And here's, here's a portion that I'm going to read this morning that tells us that Jesus really, really does love us. And I want you to notice this in verse, beginning with verse 35 of Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor th powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. I believe if there's any passage 
that takes us to the pinnacle of God's relationship to you and me is found in the verses here that we've just read. I was, um, uh, I have a book by uh, James Montgomery Boyce, and uh, Dr. Boyce is uh, a Presbyterian, but we'll forgive him for that. But he, in his commentary on this portion of scripture, he gave an illustration that, uh, that I think is just really, he told the story of an American Korean uh, who had enlisted in the army during the Korean War. And that was, uh, and, and he had, had, had enlisted as a chaplain. The man was a committed believer, and he knew the Korean language, and he was assigned to bring sense of order to the compounds where North Korean soldiers were imprisoned and having been captured by Allied forces. And they, this uh, chaplain did not know what to do or even begin to know how to do anything with them. Then the Lord prompted him to do something very unusual. As he entered into the first holding pen where several hundred soldiers were uh, bound, he spoke to them in their own language. And when he did, they immediately crowded around him to hear what this American Korean had to say. And he began to teach them how to sing a rough translation of this little chorus, Jesus Loves Me. Then he taught them what the words meant. And then he went from uh, section to section of those vast compounds and repeated this over and over again, teaching them to sing the song and teaching them what the song meant. And, uh, and that over the course of maybe uh, three months or several thousand communist soldiers placed their faith in Jesus Christ. And after the war, they refused to rejoin the communist party. It does not get any simpler are richer than the fact that Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us. That's a closing song of the book of Romans and book of Romans in chapter 8. Jesus loves me is the primary reason we can sing it with absolute security. Amen. Here in the text, if you follow along in it, is the summit of Romans chapter 1 through 8. And perhaps the summit of the entire Bible because it magnifies the eternal, unchangeable, unfathomable love that God has for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. One writer used the analogy of a mountain climber who is tied to a uh, to, his guide, uh, to his guide by a rope. And he's climbing through the treacherous routes up and down the slopes and he doesn't fall to his death because of the rope. He concluded that Christ is our guide who never slips and the rope is what ties us securely to him in his great love for us as seen in his sacrifice on the cross. So no truth can transform your life more than God's gracious love. Right? I mentioned to you last Sunday that the previous Saturday, I had talked to a young man that did not want to hear anything I had to say. And when I left him, I told him, I said this, you'll never forget my visit with you because I'm going to tell you this, I love you and Jesus Christ loves you too. 
Boy, that's the most profound thought that a human being could have, that God Almighty that created the universe would condescend to say, I really love you. I may not like the way you live, but I love you anyway. I, I, um, my mother used to say to her, uh, to her grandchildren, I don't like you, and, she, and then she'd say, but I sure do love you. And that's exactly what we ought to think about today. Surely, here Paul tells us that what sin could not do and Satan cannot do, even in the terrible situations of life, he cannot take away our security in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this context, the term love of Christ refers to our salvation, and he speaks of our special relationship with our God. Now, if you're taking notes now, notice first of all, his passion for us is very encouraging according to verse 35 and 36. If you'll notice the word in that passage is the word separate. In verse 35, it means to divide, to cut off or chop off. In other words, if it was translated in our modern day, it would maybe the term amputate. Who can amputate us from the love of God and who can amputate God's love for us? Of course, the answer is absolutely nothing. Nobody. And regardless of what we face as we go through life, nothing we face is able to come between us and the love of God. You think about that. His love is encouraging and it will endure through anything at all. And all through these passages, the Apostle Paul gives us several categories of things that are unable to separate us from the, from the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at two of them. And you may not have them in your notes, but I hope you do have them in your notes. First of all, Jesus loves, Jesus' love is not broken by emotional factors. Look at the beginning of verse 35. He says, tribulation or distress. Now, the word tribulation comes from the Greek word meaning inner pressure. Do you have any inner pressure? I had two things that was inner pressure to me this yesterday. It caused me to maybe lose a few moments of sleep last night, but I won't tell you what they are because it's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> but I had two pressures, and even though I enjoyed the day, I had a wonderful time visiting, which I is, uh, rather than preaching, one of my favorite things to do is to knock on doors and invite people to church or try to tell somebody how to be saved. That's the greatest privilege in all the world. In fact, years ago, when I had a blind professor. He was blinded at age 15 when he fell from a pear tree into a number two wash tub, damaged his optic nerve, and, and within two years, he was totally in the dark. He started memorizing the Bible and memorized the entire New Testament and many, many of the books of the Old Testament. In fact, he went on to get his THD at one of the most prestigious seminaries in the, in the country, and he wrote his thesis by Hebrew commentary on the book of Amos. He had to design his own, uh, his own uh, braille in Hebrew as well as Greek. And uh, someone asked him, one day, if you could open your eyes and see one thing, what would it be? Well, he smiled and he said, I know that my son tells me that there are a lot of beautiful colors today and flowers and mountaintops and snow caps, and he named several things that his son had described to him. But he said, you know what I would like to see? He said, I've never seen anybody get saved. I would like to have my eyes open at one time and see, even though I've led many people to Christ myself, I never physically saw somebody get born again. 
What a desire, amen? <laughs> what a desire. What a great love he has for the lost. And so there may be some things that may be building up in your life right now. Discouragement or even anger or even bitterness. And sometimes these inner feelings of calamity and pain uh, will make us wonder, does God really love us? Or does God really love me? <laughs> well, the Bible says that he does. And even though those inner feelings may be present, it cannot cut off or amputate God's love. I have been in difficult situations in ministry. I'm not sure how... Uh, if I knew what I was getting into, I would have gone into it. But there's a lot of, been a lot of, lot of opposition because of the preaching of the gospel of Christ and because of my stand. And sometimes it, because of some of my, my foolishness, as I, I, I got myself into uh, uh, hard places. And there's been times when I would just wonder, is, are you still out there, God? Are you still out there? But then you get back into the Bible and you see, hey, no, there's nothing can separate us from the love of God. And then he uses the word distress here. If you look in your Bible, which is in the Greek means uh, hardship, out of pressure, uh, with lack of courage. And it's a word used to describe because being caught between two rocks, like we say, between a rock and a hard place. You feel like you're not only getting pressure from within, but you're getting a lot of pressure from without. Whether it be uh, your pressure on your job or your family members or pressure from your friends. Well, the Bible says even, even the worst kind of pressure from without cannot cause emotional pain enough to amputate God's love for you. Amen and amen. Would you join me in that? In this verse, the Apostle Paul uses another category. He says that the love of Jesus is not broken by physical factors. He says, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sorrow, even physical pain cannot amputate God's love for us. But the question then becomes a, a very a problem. Why do Christians have to suffer? And so we hear on television and, and see some of these birds going across the country telling us about this prosperity gospel. Is that if you've got any pain, you've got sin in your life. Well, I've got pain. <laughs> and there's sin. It must be a lot of sin in my life. And you need to confess your sin or get rid of your pain or get rid of this. And get rid of it. Now, why does God allow pain? Dr. A.W. Tozier, and who was a tremendous, uh, 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 I believe, Bible scholar, even though he had no formal education, uh, <laughs> just like Dr. Uh, Adrian Rogers said, you have to go to college to become a liberal. <laughs> so, and, so anyway, he didn't go to college, but he, he, said, he said this. He said, it, is, it was the, uh, he said, Praise the Lord for, uh, let me go back and read this, because it was, he said, it was the enraptured Rutherford who would shout in the midst of sorrow and his painful times, praise the Lord for the hammer. He went on to say the hammer is a useful tool, but the nail, if it had feeling and intelligence, could present another side of the story. For the nail only knows the hammer as an opponent, a brutal, merciless enemy who lives to pound it into submission, to beat it down out of sight and to clinch it into place. And that's the nail view of the hammer, and it's accurate except for one thing. The nail forgets that both it and the hammer are servants in the ha hands of the same workman. And let the nail but remember that the workman holds a hammer and all resentment toward it will disappear. The carpenter decides whose head shall be beaten next and what hammer shall be used in the beating. That's his sovereign right. 
And when the nail has surrendered to the will of the carpenter and has gotten a little glimpse of the benign pains, plans for the future, it will yield to the hammer without complaint. End of quote. There are those who feel they are hammered. You ever feel that way sometimes? And maybe feeling like the nail, you're, you're a target of a lot of pain. You must remember that even the pain one suffers will not separate him from the love of God. He quotes what the psalmist wrote in, verse, uh, in Psalm 42, verse 22. In the next verse there, down at the bottom page in my Schofield Bible, it says, Yea, for thy sakes we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, in quoting this verse, which gives a prophetic description of the martyrdom of the believers during the tribulation period, David is referring to this time when the new believer saved after the rapture of the church will be, uh, has taken place, who will follow Christ and refuse to follow the Antichrist and will die as a result of it. But the application of this can be made to you and to me today, regardless of what the physical pain is, we're going to, we're going to we will ne never be separated from the love of God. In 1949, the communists took over China. A man, a man that was, grew up in my home church went off to uh, Bible college, and his, and his wife had spent probably, they went there probably in the 20s to China and spent their life there. In fact, he rode a bicycle 89 miles to get away from the communist uh, uh, army, army and he said what they would do, would, uh, they would come in and ask about a person's Christian testimony. And if they were Christians, the adults, they would kill them immediately. But they would have mercy on the children. They would take them and they would tell them, uh, and they would take their foot, he said, and they would draw a line this way, and they, then they would draw a line this way on the ground symbolizing the cross. And they would say to the children, spit on that cross and we'll not kill you. And those kids said, we will not spit on any image of the cross. This is what the apostle Paul, but you know what? Nothing separates us from the love of God. Absolutely not. Now look at the next point in, in our message. Secondly, his passion for us is empowering. Look at verse 37. They in all things because of what this? Because we're able to recognize this and God's love is eternal. It's, uh, God's love is not, you cannot amputate it. You cannot amputate it. It cannot be cut off. But he goes on to say, and right in there the Holy Spirit says, write this down, Paul. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's right here that the Apostle Paul gives the answer and tells us that through these things we are more than conquerors. And the term more than conquerors is one word in the Greek and it means overwhelmingly, exceedingly, super conquer. <laughs> and the first part of the, the word is hyper. And then we hear the prefix Hyper, the first thing we think of is what? A three-year-old kid running around the house in, in non-stop activity, but that's not it. But the Latin translation is super, which gives a little different perspective. It means above, greater, spectacular, because he lives within us and empowers us to stand. The genuine believer proves that he is real by the life he lives. Amen? And if the things of the world such as those mentioned back in 35, verse 35, can come between us and our living for the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a possibility that we've never been saved in the first place. Why? Because God's love is so strong, it empowers us to face anything that comes our way if we're willing to yield ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're able to weather the storms of conflict and tribulation and affliction and turmoil and persecution and you want to still live for the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a 
a good sign that you have the real thing. Now, I'm not in favor of us going out here offering our heads in a guinea team just to show that we love God, but brother, if it, man, there is a decision that has to be made, that is an awful decision to have to make. But if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you remember that he loves us, and whether it takes our head or what, we're going to keep on loving him. Amen? And that's what happens. I remember when I, got, when I was sick in the hospital with this uh, COVID, I thought, you know, I, I just may die. And boy, you just, you just feel so bad. If you all know how you feel, you just feel so bad, you just feel bad. You just, uh, and I, I told the Lord, I said, and that's the only prayer I could pray, is that, Lord, I still love you. Because I know you love me. In spite of all that's going on in my life right now, you love me, and I love you. We ever tell him sometime that you love him? I remember we had a man, man in our church years ago that used to, used, to, used to start his prayer and say, Lord Jesus, we love you. That's how he started his prayer. I like that, didn't you? I love you. I love you. Say amen. When everything that comes along blows up, of course you're in for a better checkup. Amen. So remember that according to this verse, the love of God empowers you to continue until the end. Amen. And then notice in verse 38 and 39. His passion for us is endless. Paul closes this chapter by speaking of his confidence in his own security and that of the redeemed. He tells us that what we have is not a hope so thing, but that we can be confident in looking through this verse as one can see. Ten different things one might would, uh, yeah, think about that might separate us from the love of God. So here he shows the Lord's passion by, by be, as being endless in two major categories. Notice them, if you will. First of all, the love of the Lord Jesus is not broken because of earthly factors. He said, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor things present, nor things to come. He says, even death cannot separate us from the love of God. And those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior knows that we, when we do die, we are ushered in to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mentioned earlier in the message about my blind professor. He said, you know, fellows, I got it on you folks. He said, the next person I see will be the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's the next, and he's, he's there now. He's got eyes. He can see now. And he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Heard the story about a man uh, who was uh, having his tombstone prepared. And he said, uh, I don't want uh, uh, you to put uh, on my uh, tombstone the date that I was born and the date and I died. He said, I want you to write on my tombstone the day that I was born again. And then the next date, you put beside it the date he's transferred to heaven. Amen. I like that. I don't want to have that baby put on mine, but I like the way it is. <laughs> Notice a couple of words there in verse 39. It said, neither height nor depth. Now, the word height means the highest pinnacle on the earth. And the word death is a Greek word which means it's bathos. And, it, and it, the word, and it translated depth in our uh, authorized version, and it means to an extreme degree. We talk about the deepest part of the ocean being what? You people that study the sea? Yeah. Bathosphere. That means what? The deepest part of the ocean. Even the deepest depth of the ocean cannot separate us from the endless love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And no earthly factor can. Nothing you experience in your time on earth can separate you or amputate you from the love of God. Notice the next category. The love of God is not broken because of heavenly factors. 
He said, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any other creature. Here he mentions angels and principalities. This is an interesting word. It means demons holding dominion. That means that demons that are operating today cannot stop the love of God. Then he uses the powers, which means anything that can perform. It doesn't make any difference what it is. Anything that can perform cannot separate us from the love of God. And then last he uses, he uses the term any other creature. Actually, the word creature means created thing. Now, there's a lot of talk about today about uh, life on other planets. And if there is, this right here is included. Well, if there's life on other planets, evidently God created them there, amen, and put them there. Uh, for the word means any other created things that doesn't fit into these categories. <laughs> and even if aliens are real and they invaded earth, they cannot separate us from the love of God. Nothing in heaven or earth can separate us from his love. It has, if Paul is saying here, look, in case there's something possibly been omitted in the prior 16 things I've mentioned in this paragraph, this last one simply, it simply covers everything. Since God created everything, there is absolutely nothing that can possibly separate us from the love of God. Amen? Folks, the love of God is not just some principle. It's not some delegated feeling that we have. It's a real fellowship with God Almighty through the Lord Jesus Christ. Spurgeon, Spurgeon said this on his deathbed. Somebody said this, and I'm just quoting what he said. He may not have said this, but I, I, I read this, and he, he said this. He was dying, and he said, Tranquil and happy, though very weak, my theology is very simple. I can express it in a few words, and they are enough to die by. And he slowly said, Jesus died for me. What is the conclusion of all this? Write this down. Because Jesus Christ loves you, there isn't anything that can separate you. Aren't you glad? Aren't you happy in the Lord Jesus Christ? Someone uh, paraphrased this passage. And uh, sometimes I like for them to do that, but sometimes it's not, they do it for the emphasis and it's certainly not an issue of translation. It's just the way somebody paraphrases. When you paraphrase something, you're not really translating it. That's why this paraphrased Bible, you just should not, should not use that as a Bible because it's, it's, not, it's paraphrased. Here's how he paraphrased this, this passage that we've used this morning. He said, God, I may fall flat on my face. I may fail you until I feel old and beaten and done in. Yet your love for me is changeless. All the music may go out of my life. My private world may shatter to dust. Even so, you will hold me in the palm of your steady hand. No turn of affairs of my fractured life can baffle you. Satan, with all of his braggadocia, cannot distract you. Nothing can separate me from your measureless love. Pain can't. Disappointment can't. Anguish can't. Love, um, um, uh, your measureless love. Yesterday, today, and tomorrow can't. The loss of my dearest one can't. Death can't. Life can't. Riots, wars, insanity, our, our, our hunger, our disease. None of these things, nor all of these things heaped up together can budge the fact that I am dearly loved completely forgiven and forever free through Jesus Christ, your beloved son. Boy, I like the paraphrase, even though it's not inspired. It may be inspired like Shakespeare, but boy, it says a lot that nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus. How many of you in your Christian life have ever had doubt about your relationship with the Lord? Would you be honest enough with, to raise your hand? You've, you've had doubts. Well, the only thing that can cure doubt is the truth of God's word. 
you know what? It's not, that, not one other thing can cure the doubt because I had it. I had a bad case of it. I never in my life doubted that God called me to preach. <laughs> now, if you want to try to figure that out, just go ahead and work on it because I hadn't been able to. But it's time when I had doubt whether I was saved. Now, someone would look at me and say, well, hey, you're an ordained preacher. Surely you're going to heaven. That didn't help me. That did not help me. The only thing that helped me was the word of God. And I found a portion of scripture that became a part, just, it became a part of my life and just unreal. It just went right deep into my soul. The apostle John wrote 1 John for people like me. Because all through the whole book he wrote about doubt. 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. And this is the record that God had given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. So my Christian life is not in me, it's in him. Uh, got it? The next verse says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. I did. I believed on him. He went on to say, These things have I written you unto you that believe, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may have everlasting life. Now, the word no is a very unusual word because there are two words that are translated from the Greek into our authorized version as no. One of them is the word oida. It means, okay, I know, I know, and let me just say, I know the former coach at Alabama football. What is his name? Anybody know? Saban. The one that just retired. Nick Saban. Nick Saban. Now, I can tell everybody that I know Nick Saban. That means I know him in my mind. I know about him. But suppose I had the wonderful privilege of going to the University of Alabama, and they tell me he still has an office there. And I would go in, and they would introduce me to Nick Saban. I would greet him and I'd tell him my name is Jim Lilly and Nick Sabian would say my name is Nick Sabian. Sabian. I would meet him and know him personally. That's the word gano. And so the word gano is used here that you might know personally, not know about, but that you might know personally. God wants you to know personally that he loves you, not because, oh, the love of God, love out here. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about right on inside of me that God is telling me that I am a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing can separate me from the love of God. Amen. Now, I never mentioned the word Baptist in my talk this morning about security in the Lord. All I talked about is what the Bible teaches. I am a Bible believer by conversion. I am a Baptist by conviction because of what the Bible says about eternal security. So today, you've got a, a portion of the course on a doctrine of eternal security. Question. If you were to die right now, where would you go? How do you know? Oh, I've heard about Jesus. I joined the church. Don't give me that one. That, that, that's not in the Bible. That won't work. Well, listen, I, 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 I do love the Lord. I try to do my best I can. That won't get it there. The only thing that will get you to heaven is repentance and faith 
in the only door to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so what you have to do, you see here, you're headed toward hell. And you're, you're born that way. And sometime in your life, God turns a light on your life, and you can get more light if you move over closer to it. And if you move over over closer to it, you get more light. And that's how God saves people. But you can do this, like the young man last Saturday I was talking to. He had the light, but he turned his back on the light, and he continues to walk in darkness. And if he continues to walk in darkness and he dies, he's going to hell. Right? Now, the only way a person can absolutely know for sure is repent of their sin and trust Jesus Christ. They say, you may be a church member, it may be, that, all, that won't work. That won't work. Only through faith in Jesus Christ will get you to heaven. Now let me ask you this. Most of us here would raise their hand and say, preacher, I am saved. I can tell you a time when I was born again. But let me ask you this. Are you really living for Jesus? You read your Bible every day, and do you pray every day? Do, do you try to witness to people every day? Or is religion like a coat, like my coat I put on this morning? Put it on, brought it to church, and when I get home, I'll take it off. That's the way some people's Christianity is. Go out of here and live like the devil, and, and expect, to, expect everybody to think you're saved, don't come here with me. Listen, that old dog won't tree a squirrel, I'm telling you. It won't work. Only through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ will work. And may God help you to do so. May God challenge you. It's just like Brother Britton told me when he came to church here. He said, preacher, he said, I want to tell you this. You're, you'll be the pastor and it won't bother me a bit for you to look me straight in the eye and ask me, how many people did you witness to this past week? How much time did you spend alone with the Lord? How much time did you pray? Would that work with you? Would you mind if I ask you right straight to your point? And so I'm asking all of us together, when was the last time you really got serious about Bible study? When was the last time you really got serious about prayer? How many of you know somebody that's going to hell and if they died today, they'd go to hell? Raise your hand if you know. Do you care enough to pray for them? Are you concerned about them enough to pray for them? God help us to be faithful and let them know that, hey, we have everything in the love of the Lord Jesus and we're just anticipating this coming. I know you're watching your watch. Go ahead and keep watching it. Well, we'll get through in a minute. I'm the one that's tired. You're not. You're sitting. <laughs> Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our heads are bowed.